events that have taken place on this day in history. The weather for Wassa today, partly sunny with a high near 52. Tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 37. Friday, a 30% chance of showers afternoon, mostly cloudy with a high near 53. And currently in Wassa, with fair skies, it's 36 degrees at 859. everyone and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse, this Thursday edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We study the Bible verse by verse and we are currently in the book of 1 Corinthians. We come in our study today to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1. The views and the opinions of this program are solely the views of myself and may not be the same as that of our management group, the Friends of WNRBLP, or our owners, the Wassa Area Hmong Mutual Association. So if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and follow along if you are able to do that. I think that's the best way to go. I will pray, Lord, I ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Now, see, the reason he brought this up is because he started the church in Corinth. And then he left and, and you know, ministered elsewhere. And when he le- after he left, some false teachers came in and were trying to undermine his authority as an apostle. So he's defending that. And... Um, He says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the risen Lord? And actually, that was one of the prerequisites of being an apostle of Jesus Christ. One had to see see him after he was raised from the dead. That was important because the apostles were to be eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And Paul qualified. Verse 2, even though I may not be an apostle to others, in other words, in other people's minds, Surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. They believed in Christ through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And so God had chosen him to go to Corinth so that these former pagans could hear about Jesus Christ and be saved. 3. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. And again, false teachers in Corinth were putting the Apostle Paul down in his absence, undermining his apostolic authority. So he says, I'm going to defend myself. And he says in verse 4, don't we have a right to food and drink? And he did. As one who taught the word of God, Paul had the right to receive the hospitality of the Christians who were taught. As only common sense, as only common decency, as well as being biblical. He wasn't in it for the money. But he did deserve it. Verse 5, he says, Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas or Peter? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? You know, Paul, he did not have an easy life as a Christian. You know, we think of these apostles as being super saints, and in in a sense they were, but they were very down-to-earth, where-the-rubber-meets-the-road type of individuals, too. The Apostle Paul did not have an easy life. He worked hard. And he didn't get rich either. He worked hard. He worked hard as a preacher. And he also worked a secular job when the offerings didn't come in. 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? 
Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? In other words, people get paid for the work they do. That's the way the Creator meant it to be. An honest day's work for an honest day's wage. Verse 8. Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? In other words, this is God's idea. Which makes work a spiritual act, by the way. And so is getting paid because of that work. And that's because God, in His Word, says that that's the way it should be. Verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Even animals should be compensated for their work. With food, anyway. You know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be expected to work on an empty stomach. God wants, a, God wants people to treat animals, you know, in a humane way. Verse 10. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. You know why communism failed so miserably and continues to fail wherever it is practices, those few places? I'll tell you why. It's because it removes the incentive to work, the incentive which God says should be there. Verse 11. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap material harvest from you? In other words, we taught you the Bible, and so you should give us an offering as a result. You know, a preacher, someone who preaches God's Word or teaches God's Word, should be treated with at least as much respect as a farmer, or for sure an ox. And they, get it, they at least get to eat the corn that they're treading out. 12. If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So the apostle is saying that they did not demand an offering in payment for teaching the Bible but it still would have been the proper thing for these Christians to do. Verse 13. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? And in the same way the Lord commanded, the Lord has commanded, that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel? People pay the clerk at the store where they get their food. You pay the gas station attendant at the gas station where you buy your gas. And God says that Christians should give their offerings to the preacher who feed them the Word of God. That's what He's saying. And so any person who doesn't do that is out of the will of God. And they cannot expect God's blessing until they obey Him in that area as well as every area. 15. But I have not used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. So what Paul is saying is that he, he isn't using strong-arm tactics to get these Christians to give. That's not what he's doing. He's simply giving them the Word of God. He's teaching them what the Bible says about this subject. Verse 16. Yet, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul brought up offerings. He brought up the subject of offerings and paying preachers. If you get fed the Word of God, then you ought to pay the preacher. Give him an offering. He brought it up because it's part of the Word of God. It's a very important thing in the mind of God. It's one of His commands. 
So he brought up the subject, but he sure didn't preach for the money. Like he says here in verse 16, he makes it clear. He preached because God called him to preach. Let me say this. Any preacher who wouldn't get a second job and preach for nothing if need be is not called by God to preach. They're thinking of their preaching or their teaching as a career, as a profession. It's not a calling. They ought to get out of the business. 17. He says, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. God Almighty puts the need to preach and teach the Word of God in every man that He calls. They could say, forget it, I'm not going to do it. But they sure would be miserable. Because it's inside of them. It's what God is telling them to do. Verse 18. What then is my reward? Just this. That in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge. And so not make use of my rights in preaching it. The people should have given him offerings. That was their duty before God. And they're out of God's will for not doing that. But because the apostle loved the Lord, he was willing to do it for free. And because he was called, he was still willing to do it for free. You know, whether they give or not, that's between them and God. Whether Paul preaches or not, that's between him and God. He's going to take care of business. Whether they do or not, that, that's up to them. But he's going to continue to do it. 19. Though I am free... And belong to no man. I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. In other words, he was sensitive to other people's sensitivities. So that he wouldn't do anything to turn anyone off from Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verse 20. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. To sum it up, this is what he is saying. I bent over backwards. He, Paul says, I'm, I bent over backwards, and I continue to bend over backwards to make sure I'm not offensive as a Christian. I don't want to be personally offensive. Now, the Apostle Paul taught the Bible loud and clear. He was a straight shooter when it came to the Word of God, and of course, a lot of people are offended by the Word of God. And, and you know, there's nothing you can do about that. But he tried his best not to be personally offensive. If the Word of God offends, well, there's not much you can do about that. That you just don't want to be offensive personally as a Christian. You don't want to do anything in your own personal life to turn someone off from Jesus Christ. 23. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. The most important thing is to tell people that Jesus is ready and able to save them from hell. That's the most important thing. And like the Apostle Paul, a Christian should conduct themselves in a manner that gives them an opportunity to do that. Verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. In other words, he's saying, give Jesus your best shot. Live for Christ the best you possibly can. Train for holiness. Discipline yourself for spiritual success. Just like an athlete trains to be a winner. That's the kind of effort that every Christian should put into... That's that's the kind of effort every Christian should put into... 
living for the Lord. Sorry about that. Verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Work hard for Jesus, is he, is what he is saying. Live for Christ. Not only does Jesus deserve it, but like he says here in verse 25, he's going to make it worth our while in eternity. You can bet that. He will do that. 26. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. In other words, if you're a Christian, live each day with a purpose. Don't slide through your day feeling groovy, you know, like the old song says. No matter what a person day, person's day involves, it should be lived with Jesus in mind, with that purpose, to please Him. 27. No, he says, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Discipline, self-denial, self-control. is a, You know, if a Christian isn't willing to exercise these things, then they're going to be useless to Jesus Christ and they're going to be an embarrassment to the God that they claim to belong to. It's 9.15. Time for our break. Please listen to this. I'll be back in a minute. You're listening to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. This is By the Way. Boy, the hours of daylight are really short these days. And there's a kind of depression that seems to get worse when it is dark and dreary outside. Well, here's a thought. Turn on a bright light. Then, open your Bible to Psalm 33. It's a psalm of praise. Read Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18 say, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. How wonderful it is to have a God who cares how we feel. The Lord God is the source of all light. There's much in the Bible about His love, His light, His salvation. A little of this light can make any day brighter. This is By the Way. And with fair skies, it is 36 degrees in Wausau. Sorry about that. 36 degrees in Wausau at 916. Welcome back to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and we are studying 1 Corinthians. We come now to our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we pick it up in verse 1, which reads, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the, through the sea. And that's talking about the Red Sea miracle, where God parted the Red Sea so that the Israelites could escape the, uh, the Egyptian army after he delivered them from slavery. God led the Israelites through the wilderness and actually through that sea with a cloud. He was present in a cloud and it was like a compass. Led them right through the Red Sea, led them through the wilderness until they reached the promised land. All of God's people were a part of that tremendous blessing. Verse 2, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. To be baptized means to be identified with. So what this is saying is that all the Israelites who came out of Egypt identified themselves with God's man and their leader, Moses. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food. So they were all blessed with the bread from uh, heaven, the bread of God, the manna. Every morning it was there. You know, they didn't have breakfast in bed, but they had a free breakfast every single morning for 40 years. So they all, they all were partakers of that tremendous blessing. And then in verse 4 it says, And they drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And if you read the Old Testament account about the Israelites' journey to the Promised Land, you will see that as they traveled through the desert, 
God provided fresh water for the entire population, and you're looking at about a million and a half people. That you, That's huge. You know, that's three Milwaukee's almost, maybe two for sure, as far as population is concerned. Every single day he provided fresh water for them. And that water which he gave them, that water which gave them life, was a type of Jesus Christ who gives God's people spiritual life today. He even says, I'm the water of life. Verse 6. Now, these things occurred as examples. Actually, we got to go back to verse 5. I don't want to miss this. After stating all these blessings that God, God's people shared in, verse 5 says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. So, most of them were punished by God because they lost their faith in Him. They were punished with physical death. You say, well, what does that have to do with me as a Christian? Well, look at verse 6. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. You don't want to set your heart on evil things. It's one thing to fall into sin and then to confess it as a Christian and get back on track. But when you set your heart on evil things, when that becomes a way of life, you're in trouble with God. You're in danger. And what happened to the faithless, sinful Israelites stands as a warning shot to Christians today. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. So they were God's people. But that didn't give them a free pass to sin. They evidently thought that it did, but it didn't. They thought wrong, and they died as a result. Verse 9, We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And so they pushed God to the breaking point with their lack of faith and their whining and their sin. And, and finally God judged. Judged with physical death. Look at verse 10. He says, And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. God hates grumbling, and he hates complaining. You know why? It's because God is sovereign. The Bible says he's working all things together for the good of those who love him. That would be good and bad. So all complaining is complaining against God. All complaining is complaining about how God conducts business as God. 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And so God wrote down all those punishments in the Old Testament that God's people had to endure. He wrote all that stuff down in order to warn us today to be faithful to Him. 12. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Don't become overconfident as a Christian, is what he is saying. You know, just because a, a person is a Christian, that doesn't mean that they can't fall into sin and fall into unbelief. And as a, as a result of that, fall into the displeasure and chastisement of the Lord. And it can get very serious. Say, I'm in trouble. What can I do? Well, God has given you the means to be victorious. Look at verse 13. He says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What a great promise. He always provides an escape for every temptation. Which means when a Christian sins, they can't blame their mother. They can't blame society. It's their fault. Because with every single temptation, God gives us a way to avoid the sin. That's why if we sin, it's because we choose it. We choose the sin rather than the escape that God provides with every temptation. Verse 14, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry, you say, well, I don't commit this sin. I don't have any stone idol. I don't have any wooden idol in my 
backyard with a shrine that I bow down and worship, well, that's good. But idolatry isn't just worshiping a stone idol. Anyone or anything that we put before God in our hearts is an idol, and by doing that, we commit the sin of idolatry. Fifteen. He says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And he's referring to Holy Communion. The consecrated bread and the consecrated wine are the body and blood of Christ. And uh, what he is saying is that we participate in the Lord's body and blood when we receive Holy Communion. And, And this goes along so well with what the Old Testament people of God did when they brought their sacrifices and their offerings to the temple. They would bring the offerings, they would offer them to God. It was a very sacred ceremony. And then they would receive them back and they would sit down and they would eat the offerings in the temple. And and it's just like Jesus. He offers himself for us on the cross. The bread and the wine are his body and blood, which he offered for us. And then we eat it. See, it, it just parallels the Old Testament so perfectly. Verse 17. But notice this. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. In other words, he's saying, by taking Holy Communion together, believers show their unity in Jesus Christ. 18. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? And that's what I was talking about. In Old Testament days, after the Israelites offered a sacrifice to God, they would eat it. And so they participated in the offering. Verse 19. Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of the pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to participate with demons. Again, he reiterates the fact that idols are nothing. But idol worship is inspired by demons. It's an effort by demons to get people's devotion off of the one true God and onto something else. And some of the Christians in Corinth were making offerings to idols, and Paul said, stop it. You can't worship the devil or demons and God. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. God will not share his glory or his honor with anyone or anything. You know, we either put God first. He is either the one and only one that we worship, or he'll have nothing to do with us. And notice verse 22. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Christians, beware. Get dead serious about putting God first, or you're going to be dealing with an angry God whose discipline you're not going to be able to counter. And in 23, everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. As long as it isn't sin, a Christian is technically free to do it. But we should use our heads by not doing anything that will harm us or harm someone else. 24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Wanting to do something isn't a good enough reason by itself to do it, if you're a Christian. We should consider what effect something will have on others before we do it. 25. Eat nothing sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. If there was a surplus of meat offered to idols, then those who were in charge of the the idolatry, you know, the place where it was conducted would sell the meat at the meat market. He had all this excess meat. So that's what they would do. Fine. That's what they want to do. Well, Paul says, Christians, don't ask if the meat that you want to buy at the meat market has been offered to an idol because you're just going to have to wrestle with your conscience over whether you should eat it or not. Verse 26, For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You know, it's silly to ask the question, was this meat offered to an idol? It's silly 
because an idol is nothing. That meat belongs to the Lord God like everything else on this planet. Consequently, all the question does is raise a conscience issue that doesn't even need to be raised. You know, I'm running out of time here. I was hoping to get through this chapter, but I better stop. My name is Michael Moret. The name of this program is Scripture Verse by Verse. I'm with you Monday through Friday at 9 o'clock. And if you have any questions or comments for me, you can write me at Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, 54402-2211. Or send me an email if that's easier for you. You can do that at vbyvmm at aol.com. That's vbyvmm at aol.com. If you want to come and worship with us on Sunday morning, you're welcome to do that. We have church at 10 o'clock in the morning Sunday at Island Place, which is right next to Oak Island. You're welcome to come and join us. It starts at 10 o'clock, lasts about 50 minutes, a simple service, right to the point. And it glorifies Jesus Christ. Everything points to Christ. It's 10 o'clock Sunday morning, Island Place, right next to Oak Island for our church service. You're welcome to come. Until tomorrow morning, have a great day. I'll see you at 9 o'clock. So long, everyone.